Hello everyone, welcome to my FlossTube channel. My name is Jessie Lee and I'm coming at you with video number 30. And for once, I am just going to cut to the chase and show you all my stitching. I haven't gotten a whole heck of a lot done these past two weeks, but I had a lot of fun with everything that I stitched. So I'm just excited to show it to you. And the first whip that I brought out was one that I hadn't worked on in a while. So I hope it'll be fun for you to see it again after so long. And it is this vintage design from For the Love of Cross Stitch magazine from the issue of July 1994. <laughs> so this is an oldie but a goodie and I'm stitching this design here on the cover. And this pattern is called Give Thanks and it's by Cooler Design Studio. I'm not sure if you can hunt it down on the internet somewhere, but I actually bought the clipping of this pattern from Etsy. I have the magazine cover and the two pages that have the pattern. And this, is what I have stitched so far. I'm stitching it on 32 count white opalescent Lugana with all the called for DMC. And I changed the poem on the pattern to the lyrics of the Spanish folk song De Colores. That's a song from my childhood that is special to me. I think it is such a sweet song that's very meaningful. And of course, I, a folk song about colors is so appropriate to go with an image of a rainbow. So the last time I showed this to you, I had stitched the rainbow, the butterfly, the text, and the outlines of these white clouds. <laughs> and I last showed this in my whip roast, and my roast for this piece was what a pain in the neck it was to fill in all the white stitches of the clouds. It was horrendously boring. But after a break with this piece, I did bring it back out and finish up the clouds. And as you can see, I moved on to a bit of the border. I have some of this blue frame going and I got down to some of these flowers here. There's a little section of these pink flowers and then next will be a larger section of some orangey flowers. And it is so fun to play with these colors. They're really pretty and just this kind of old fashioned blocky sort of um, design and style feels very homey to me. It reminds me very much of something that my grandma would stitch. So I'm having a lot of fun with this one. It was really nice to bring it out and I'm excited for the next time I'll be working on this. Um, I'm saving all the backstitch of the piece for the very end. I'm gonna put in all the crosses first. I think this is a modest enough size piece that it won't be too intimidating to do all the backstitch all in one go at the very end. So. It's not looking terribly detailed right now, but I'm having a lot more fun stitching with it. And I think um, I'm more ready to roll with it now and progress will be a lot more smooth since I got over the hump of filling in those white clouds. Speaking of the song De Colores, I found a really nice YouTube video of a beautiful performance of this song. A man named Jose Luis Orozco, who is a bilingual children's author and recording artist, gives a nice little introduction to the song explaining its significance and meaning. And then he plays acoustic guitar and sings the song. And it is such a beautiful, simple performance of it that just completely captures the spirit of that song. And I've just been watching that video again and again. It is such a sweet, lovely performance. His voice is beautiful. You can tell he loves the song and that it's special to him. And it's definitely a children's song. The whole second verse is about chickens, <laughs> but it's just such a meaningful song to me. It's a song that I learned when I was a kid. Um, I listened to it, I sang it, I even performed it a few times in various theater groups I was in. It's just a song that followed me throughout my childhood and it does have really meaningful lyrics. I love that it's about appreciating the colors of nature and how colors are just a feast for the eyes and the feeling of gratitude for being able to sense colors. I just think that's very special and meaningful. So I was so happy to find that YouTube video of someone singing it in such a beautiful, sweet way. So I will put a link to that video down below, as well as a link to a YouTube video of 
how I originally heard the song, which was it being performed by Rafi, who was also a children's recording artist who was popular in the 80s and 90s. I don't know if any of you remember him from back then, but I grew up on Rafi music and De Colores was one of the songs that he performed. And I will post a link to the video of my first experience of the song. It's just a very special folk song that's so pretty and I just want to spread it around. Last Sunday, I got to spend a little bit of time with my Sabbath stitch, which is Quaker Peace by Remembering Bygone Stitches. This is the design. And this is what I have stitched. The last time I showed this to you, I had all of these motifs done as well as the colorful half of this large motif here. So this past Sabbath, I got done the green part of this. There is one more large motif in this top row that will fill out the corner and mark the entire width of this piece. And then I think I will do all the vertical motifs over on this side to sort of mark out um, the length of the piece. I'm not really doing this one page by page. I'm going motif by motif, but this one was super fun to finish up. It went really quickly because this one is not very blocky. It's mostly just lines. So the little bit of stitchy time that I had for this um, was really rewarding because that motif went really fast. I was disappointed that I did not have time to stitch in the very fun teeny motif surrounding it. There are a couple little hearts to put in as well as an infinity symbol and a four leaf clover that will go all around the sky before I move on to a bigger motif right here in the corner. I am stitching this on 36 count um, fabric flare even weave in historic beige one over two <laughs> with Threadworks colors. What are the numbers? Threadworks 1064 and 1078 are the two threads that I chose for this piece. I'm having a lot of fun with these colors. Um, they're somewhat muted, even though they are quite rainbowy. They're muted and it's on a beige fabric, usually more antique, primitive, beigey, older, more muted things are not my usual style. So I felt very proud of myself for picking this out, but looking at it, yeah, probably could peg this as a Justine choice. <laughs> I just love my colors, you guys. Bright colors and especially pastels. So this one's a beigey pastel going on, but this one's super fun. Um, This isn't a high priority piece for me. I'm not rushing to get it done, but I am enjoying the process every other Sunday or so when I have time to give this one some TLC. Before I bring out my temperature whips, I do have a little seasonal stitchy throwback to share with you. Um, in my living room, I have one little shelf where I display some seasonal decor. And since it's June now, I am switching out all my spring decorations for my summer decorations. And they include a little bit of cross stitch. This is the spring cross stitch that I put out in my living room that will be packed away for a little while. <laughs> but this is a very old project of mine. I stitched this back before I had kids, probably in 2012 or 2013. And like I said, cross stitch was not a big hobby of mine back then. I just happened to see the pattern on Pinterest or somewhere and thought it was so cute that I was inspired to stitch it. I don't remember what the pattern was. I'm sorry, but I do know that the pattern had completely different colors than these. I went and switched them out for these pastels, which are my style, aren't they? <laughs> and stitching this was super slow going for me at the time. I don't know why it was slow and tedious for me, but it was. It wasn't the smoothest stitching project that I've ever had. And um, it did leave me feeling uninspired to stitch anymore at the time. But I did really enjoy the finished product and I've put it out as decor in the springtime ever since. And here's what the back of the piece looks like. Um, even before I was really into cross stitch and knew what I was doing, I figured out this method of a hoop finish with lacing and a coordinating piece of fabric to cover up the back of my stitching. So, this is my little spring old <laughs> um, cross stitch hoop finish 
that I will be putting away and switching out for this one. Now I know what this pattern is. This is Garden Party by Satsuma Street. And I stitched this in 2020. It was this pattern and the Temperature Tree by Sarah the Stitch and Mommy that got me back into cross stitch and totally addicted. I had a completely different experience stitching this up. It went so quickly. It was really fun to do all these motifs one by one. I adored all the bright colors. And when I was finished stitching it, I was actually really sad that I was finished with it because I had had so much fun and loving the process more than the finished product is not something that happens for me too often. So that is how I just fell head over heels in love with cross stitch as my main hobby. It was with this piece and with the temperature tree back in 2020. Um, and here's the back of it. <laughs> See, I am sort of a one trick pony with my hoop finishes. And this is stitched on 14 count Ada. And so is this one, which is kind of funny because I have not stitched on Ada in quite a long time. But I enjoy, I enjoy seeing this piece during the summertime and it's meaningful to me. And it's such a fun design. It's so bright and cheerful and I just have good memories of stitching this, so I thought it would be fun to share the two of these with you. Next up is my temperature walk with me. This is a pattern by Sarah the Stitched Mommy, and I am stitching it for my in-laws who have two beloved doggies, and they live in Florida. I live in Minnesota, so I get to vicariously experience a completely different climate through stitching this piece. And I recently made some very important progress on it. <laughs> Here it is. As you can see, I recently put in this stretch of road right here. I still need to get the sidewalk going around this cul-de-sac, but I will put that in sometime this coming week. But it's very satisfying to have this chunk out of the way. And this part of the pattern could be a bit tedious to stitch, but it's fun because of the colors of threads that I chose. Um, the called for colors were too blue toned and blended with my fabric too much. So I picked out two warmer tones of gray and they are DMC 08 and 06. <laughs> now those are exciting to stitch with because they are part of the newest colors that DMC introduced to their line just a few years ago. DMC very rarely ever brings new colors to their line. That only happens once every couple of decades. So I was very excited to collect the new shades um, to complete my full set. That's why I picked up the 30 colors, I think it was. Um, but of course, all of the older cross stitch patterns out there don't call for these colors ever because they just didn't exist. <laughs> and newer patterns, you know, only call for them every so often. So when I do actually get to pull out some of my bobbins with those colors on them, it's pretty exciting. So I chose two of the new DMC colors for my road on this cross stitch, and that makes it bearable to stitch this rather mindless part of the design. Of course, I've been keeping up with the paws too, and I am stitching these in the called for colors from the pattern. And as you can see, they're gradually becoming more orange, which represent the high 70s and low 80s degrees Fahrenheit. I am stitching the average temperature of each day. My in-laws live in the Tampa area, um, right next to the ocean. So the temperatures where they live vacillate quite a bit throughout each day depending on the clouds and ocean mists rolling in and out. And I wanted each of these paw pads to represent how you would actually experience the majority of each day. So the temps have gotten up into the 90s for small parts of the day here and there. As the days go on, um, the records that I found do show hour by hour temps, but I just go with the average of all of those. So my Colors are transitioning rather gradually, but I just think that sort of represents how they truly experience the climate where they live. So that was just my choice and it's been an interesting experiment so far. On my piece representing Minnesota where I live, I go with the high temperature of each day. That is the temperature that it hovers around through a majority of midday into dinner time. So that's what the part of the day that you would be outside for would feel like. So. 
that's just a choice that I made differently for each piece that I'm working on, depending on the place that the piece is for. Speaking of, here is my Minnesota temperature piece, the Temperature Butterflies by Sarah the Stitchin' Mommy. I'm stitching this on 25 count Black Lugana with the brightest colors of DMC Light Effects and DMC Satin Flosses. And I got the May Butterfly done as well as the first quarter of the June Butterfly. Time is flying by, no pun intended. <laughs> and the May Butterfly is my new favorite. I am absolutely in love with these greens. They're so pretty. I'm proud of myself for all these wild colors I've chosen because they are turning out great together and they are just so contrasty on the black. This is so fun to stitch. And not only was May a beautiful butterfly, it was a beautiful springtime month. The weather was so nice. As you can see by these yellow patches here, the temperature stayed cooler, how we like them here in Minnesota. So we had a real spring in April and May. The past two years that I've stitched temperature pieces, we barely got a spring. The temperature shot right up starting in April and we had long, hot summers and it just doesn't feel normal for where we live. So having a nice cool May, um, the temperatures range from the high 50s to the low 70s. It was really lovely. It really felt like springtime and it just makes me feel encouraged that some things are still right with nature, at least around here. So this was really fun to stitch. I'm in love with how these colors are turning out and it's my temperature butterflies. I'm always so excited to show you how it's going. Something unusual about the weather around here lately, though, was that it did get a bit tornado-like this spring, which is not so normal for Minnesota. In the month of May, my town was under a tornado watch at least twice that I know of when I was paying attention. In fact, our town newsletter had a little blurb in it asking for volunteers to listen for the testing of the tornado sirens and to call into the city to let them know that the sirens were blaring as they should be. And I thought to myself, hey, what a simple thing to volunteer for. I should do that. And then I remembered that I'm from Nebraska, <laughs> which is a part of Tornado Alley here in the United States. And... Tornado sirens are really just ambient noise to me, <laughs> so it probably wouldn't register for me that I should call into the city when I heard them being tested. And another thing that I experienced for the first time since I moved to Minnesota was hail. Hail kind of goes hand in hand with tornado-y weather, and we would experience it about once or twice a year in the springtime in Nebraska. But I haven't experienced it at all since I moved to Minnesota, but it did come down when I was picking up the kids from school. In fact, it happened when Glenn and I were sitting in the car in the school parking lot waiting for Sylvia's dismissal time. The hail started raining down on our car. It was very loud and pretty nerve wracking. Um, it was marble sized hail. And I was just hoping that it wouldn't crack our windshield. And I had Glenn, of course, sit in the back seat away from the windshield in the windows. And he thought the entire experience was hilarious and exciting. He was laughing his butt off the entire time. This noisy hail was smacking our car. It lasted quite a long time. And it did dent our car a little bit, but not too seriously. And then Sylvia was able to come out of the building and meet us in the car and we drove home and we arrived home at least 30 minutes after the hail had initially come down. And the whole time I was driving home, which is several miles away from the kids' school, I was hoping that it had not hailed on our street and on our house. Um, but we pulled into the driveway and I noticed mounds of hail sitting on our grass, which meant, you know, this was 30 minutes after the hail had come down. This meant that we had gotten even heavier hail at our house, which absolutely destroyed my tulips, which had just bloomed the day before. I was so disappointed that my pretty, pretty tulips got smashed, but luckily there was no damage to our house. Very minor dents on our car. It could have been a lot worse. Hail can really be destructive so I am grateful that it wasn't worse but it was overall a 
sort of funny experience that made me feel oddly nostalgic for Nebraska. <laughs> In fact, a couple days after the hail happened, which was a couple days after one of the tornado watches happened, my next door neighbor got to chit chatting with me about my thoughts on tornadoes as a Nebraskan. Um, my neighbor is in his late 60s, I'm guessing, and he shared with me that he's originally from Washington State and he moved from there to the very house he lives in now in the early 1990s. So Minnesota has been his home for a good long time. And before that, he was a West Coaster. So tornadoes are kind of a novelty to him. So he wanted to know what I think of them. And I told him that I'm sort of desensitized to how strange the sky tends to look and how funky the air tends to feel during a tornado watch. But I do totally respect the sound of tornado sirens blaring when it's not a test. And I totally respect when the weatherman says we're under a tornado warning and it's time to get in the basement to stay safe. But all the times that I did have to hunker down in the basement, I didn't feel freaked out about it. I was just hanging out waiting for the storm to pass. Um, Those videos you find on the internet of huge tornadoes just rolling across the land destroying things those only form under the exact right conditions even in tornado alley where tornadoes are the most common in this country and the world those types of tornadoes are pretty dang rare most of the time if a tornado does manage to fully form a touchdown it's pretty small and not very powerful or long lasting. And this may just be me, but tornadoes hardly ever seem to touch down in a major metropolitan area like Omaha, where I'm from. They tend to occur out in the middle of nowhere over farmland or grassland. But you do occasionally see those stories in the news of tornadoes hitting small towns. And those stories can be very sad. Tornadoes totally can seriously damage or destroy your house and hurt or kill people, you know? So that's why I take them seriously. I am not one of those who's going to stand around outside hoping to see a tornado. I would never go chasing a storm in my car hoping to catch a cool video of a tornado. That is not for me. Tornadoes can be extremely dangerous, even if the powerful ones are really rare. So I take the weather report seriously. But overall, when I think of tornadoes, do I feel afraid? Not really. I hope that wasn't TMI about tornadoes. Anyway, <laughs> this conversation with my neighbor continued and he asked me if I'd been born in Nebraska. And I said, no, I was born in Illinois, but my mom moved to Nebraska for a job. And he was very surprised by this. And he told me that his dad was actually born in Nebraska. And so since his dad had a connection to Nebraska, he had visited Nebraska once. And he was saying this as if somebody really would only visit Nebraska if they had a compelling reason. And he didn't even tell me what part of Nebraska he visited as if it's all the same. And he went on to say that Nebraska did not appeal to him and he really didn't see why anybody would choose to live there unless they had been born there. My knee-jerk reaction was to just keep it light and agree with him and say, yeah, my family and I moved here to Minnesota on purpose because we like it better. But internally, I was kind of cringing, you know, I had those feelings people get about their siblings, like, mm, nobody can talk bad about my sibling but me. I was going, mm, nobody can talk bad about my home state but me. And it would be so easy for me to just talk bad about my home state. Because um, I do have quite a few complaints and I did move here to Minnesota on purpose because I like it a whole lot better. But... I'm still really proud to have grown up in Nebraska. 
I think it's really special to be from a place that so many people overlook and don't know a whole lot about. And there are a lot of things about Nebraska that are really special that I wish I had told my neighbor about. So I'm going to tell you guys about them. First, I just got to talk about the absolute best thing about Nebraska, and that is the people. Um, in general, Nebraskans are super duper nice, and it's something that I didn't quite realize the extent of and took for granted until I moved away. There is a term <laughs> that we say in Nebraska, we do call ourselves Nebraska nice, and it literally means that we are nice. <laughs> There's also a more widely known term, Minnesota nice. <laughs> you hear the term Minnesota nice across the country and it has a double meaning. Minnesotans are really polite to your face, but they tend to be very reserved and even passive aggressive. And I've really experienced that and worse since I've moved here. And I have been very surprised by how alienated I feel, even though I still live in the Midwest, um, which stereotypically is an area of the country where people are friendly and kind. Um, but in Nebraska, people are exceptionally so. <laughs> um, if you're just strolling down the sidewalk and pass a stranger, they will nod or wave at you and say hi. Um, Service people will chit chat with you and be super eager to help you if you have a question. And if you become somewhat of a regular at any establishment, the staff will get to know you and start treating you like a friend. Um, people in Nebraskan communities genuinely look out for one another and care about their neighbors. If your car breaks down at the side of the road, you can actually sort of expect somebody to pull over and just ask if there's any way that they can help. And people are willing to talk with you um, and get to know you. Just strangers will strike up a conversation with you and share about their lives and learn about yours. And I find that that stereotype of people in smaller towns not letting you in <laughs> because they already have their social circle that's really established for them. So they may be polite and friendly to outside outsiders, but not really make good friends with them. I find that's not actually true um, in Nebraska, at least in Omaha, which is a big city, and Wayne, which is a small college town in which I lived. Um, people are willing to make new friends and get to know you and it is pretty easy to find a place to belong amongst the people who live in Nebraska, which is really nice. And that's me saying this as someone who is extremely um, socially anxious. And that social anxiety actually made me at times feel sort of not annoyed, but overwhelmed by how nice <laughs> um Nebraskans can be. Um, it was hard for me to sometimes receive that attention and forthcomingness of being polite or willing to help or greeting you all the time. Um, I'm one of those who loves the self-checkout because I don't want to talk to people. But since I moved away, I've realized how special that is and how I took it for granted. And I really do miss it. One of the most incredible things about Omaha that I was aware of when I lived there and was grateful for is how relatively easy it is to establish a stable lifestyle there. Now, I'm not sure how the pandemic may have changed this, but I do have a clear memory of how the Great Recession affected Omaha in Nebraska or rather didn't affect them as much as the rest of the country at the time. Um, I left my parents' house to live on my own as an adult when I was 21 years old in 2008. And I, with very little job experience and no college degree, was able to find a decent paying job with plenty of hours in a novelty industry. I was not an essential worker but I was able to make enough money and find 
and live in a decent apartment at the time. And I made it as an adult. And when I was getting established in those years, I was paying attention to the news and fully aware of how much my peers across the country were struggling. And I have always been so grateful that I was privileged enough to happen to have grown up in this city where things were so stable and accessible to me. Um, Omaha is a steadily growing city, if not booming, <laughs> and there is tons of new development there. So there are plenty of jobs to go around and lots of affordable housing. And the cost of living in general is very low. Now, the wages are also lower because these things are just relative anywhere you live, but living in Omaha tends to be very affordable. And everyday things like groceries, your utilities, you know, utility companies, water, trash pickup, gas, cable and internet, um, even gasoline for your car. Um, all of these things are pretty easy to access. They're affordable. Um, the products from these places are good quality. The customer service is good. You are not screwed over <laughs> or gouged by these country companies or treated unfairly because they know they are providing you your necessities. It's pretty nice. Um, even the medical system there is fairly easy to navigate and access. Um, it's pretty easy to um, find a medical provider close to where you live with availability to see you. <laughs> um, it is nothing like that here. <laughs> um, yeah. And even just... Since its new development, the buildings throughout the city have been built more recently. So they are just in better repair. They are more modern. Um, inside, they feel more fresh and clean and bright. <laughs> um, the caveat to that is that the city feels like it lacks the character of some older places, but... Still, it feels nice to walk into a store or a restaurant that is just clean and bright and in good condition and safe. <laughs> um, I remember um, going to the local Target um, in Egan, Minnesota, shortly after I first moved here. I live in Maplewood now, but when we first got here, we were in Egan, and I went to the Egan Target and went, whoa. This building is old. It just feels kind of dark and dingy and creepy. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the Target itself at all. I mean, it had all the same products. It was clean inside and organized and the customer service was fine. But just the building, I suddenly realized just um, how spoiled I was living in Omaha where most things are just newer. You know, it feels very different. <laughs> and even the produce at the grocery stores in Omaha was just better. We lived in the middle of, you know, farmland that is Nebraska. So there was plenty of fresh fruits and veggies and meat, a great variety. And the things that were imported, you know, since we're smack dab in the middle of the country, nothing really had to travel too awfully far up here in the north. Um, not quite as many things grow locally as easily and um, imported food does have to travel a bit farther. So we either don't get certain things at all or what we do get um, isn't as fresh. And of course it's more expensive. Um, it's been a really long time since I've had a really good mango or really awesome citrus fruits in general. I don't think I've ever seen a star fruit or a passion fruit or a pomelo. <laughs> in the grocery store here when there was tons of interesting things to choose from in Nebraska. It was really fun to go to the grocery store. Just simple everyday things like that. 
I miss. Everything in Omaha was very affordable, accessible as far as availability and customer service. Truly a easy place to live as far as everyday necessities go. Now, of course, my experience of a comfy sort of lifestyle in Omaha and of Nebraskan people being so kind is due in part to my privilege as a white lady who grew up middle class. Don't get me wrong, I completely get that my experience of Nebraska is not everyone's experience, unfortunately. So let me just move on in my lecture about Nebraska being so cool by telling you what's objectively cool about it, and that's the geography. I know you think that Nebraska is nothing but flat farmland everywhere, and yeah, we have a shit ton of that. <laughs> um, but don't knock flat farmland. It is totally relaxing to road trip through, and it is actually interesting to see different crops being planted and growing and harvested throughout the year. And of course, there's lots of livestock and critters dotting the land too, which are fun to see. And there's irrigation systems and hay bales and equipment and tractors and barns and silos and those teeny rural towns, which have so much character. I love that stereotypical part of Nebraska. Come on, what's not to love? And of course, all that flat farmland reveals that magnificent wide open sky, which I've talked about before. And that's a universal feature of the entire state. I'm from the big city and I liked the great big sky there too. And of course, it's nice that most of the state is rural because it makes it easy to get away from light pollution. So you can see the nighttime stars in that humongous sky in a amazing way that you don't get to see them in a lot of places elsewhere. And of course, aside from the farmland, our major natural ecosystem in Nebraska is prairie grasslands. They are so precious and important and getting more and more rare. Unfortunately, it's shrinking, of course, due to humans. And that's an ecological problem that I think we as a society don't seem to take as much interest in. And I think it's because it's just a less popular ecosystem. We are more drawn to the magnificent beauty of the forests or the Everglades or the mountains or whatever. And we don't really observe and really look closely enough at all the grass and plants of the prairie and the interesting insects and critters and cycles that happen there. It's a cool natural ecosystem. And I'm proud that I lived close enough to it that I don't take it so much for granted. And of course, we have some wetlands. We have the wide Missouri River along the entire eastern border. And we have the Platte River with the sand hills, which are pretty famous, as well as the sand hill cranes that migrate around there. And then we have the dry, very interesting badlands in the northwestern corner of the state. And Toadstool National Park is over there which is the coolest place that way too few people even know about. Like Chimney Rock is a pretty dang famous landmark in Nebraska, but I think it's kind of overrated. And Toadstool is really underrated. The rock formations there are so pretty and weird and cool to explore. I've taken the long road trip out there twice in my life and it was totally worth it both times. And then between all of these interesting landmarks is, of course, all of the interesting small towns and communities that are so special in their own way. Each one of them is unique. And I'm really happy that I've gotten to know quite a few of them through my travels and, of course, through going to college in one. Small towns are so overlooked, and it's really unfortunate. If you are from a small town, you should really feel proud because you have the rare experience of having been born in a place where relatively very few people are ever born or ever live. So just being from a small town makes you pretty unique and special. Like I feel unique and special for having spent so much of my life in Omaha, which happens to be a pretty big city actually. It's just that 
so few people across the country really know much of anything about it. Nebraska is especially unique because it is so spread out and rural and wide open. There are so many habitable spots there that are not inhabited, which is miraculous if you think about it, considering how many billions of people on this planet. How is it possible that there are still spots of land out there that aren't crawling with people? I think that's amazing and it just makes me feel happy inside and I'm glad that that is a part of my home state of Nebraska. Um, it's part of why the state is so overlooked, but I think it is also a huge part of what makes it so special. So. I hope I haven't totally lost you going on and on about Nebraska, <laughs> but I really did just have to get out everything I wish I had said to my neighbor because he really was being kind of snooty and ignorant. <laughs> Man, I am just in a rambly mood today. I don't know why. You guys, please tell me in the comments if you like hearing about my life and things aside from cross stitch or if this rambling is something you can't stand. Give me a comment telling me what you think and I will adjust my channel content accordingly. But I really want to talk about jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> um, I recently discovered the YouTube channel Karen Puzzles and I am obsessed and she inspired me to get back into doing jigsaw puzzles. This is a hobby that I share with my husband. We would always do jigsaws together as a couple. Um, kind of boring to do a jigsaw by yourself, I personally feel. <laughs> but sitting down with Tim and cranking one out together is super duper fun. And a couple years ago, we would do them on a regular basis. And when we would complete a puzzle, I would take a picture of it and then upload that picture into a Facebook album, which I cheekily titled Puzzles with Bay. <laughs> um, so yeah. Tim and I like to do jigsaw puzzles together. We fell away from that hobby, but now we're getting back into it because I was inspired by the YouTube channel Karen Puzzles. So we did a puzzle together. I found one in our cabinet that we hadn't done and it was craft related. It was a rainbow craft supplies puzzle. Here is the picture I took of it completed by me and Tim. And it was super quick and fun to put together. And it made us want to do more. So we actually went to the mall and bought another new puzzle that we're going to put together very soon. And I will upload a picture of it to Puzzles with Bay. But this puzzle experience I had recently it reminded me of a puzzle that is very special to me. It is a Christmas puzzle that I have framed and that I hang up in my living room around Christmas time. It is a puzzle of this image here by the artist Scott Gustafson, and it's called Woodland Santa. And I just think the image of this Santa is very, very sweet. I've said before in my videos that I'm really not much of a Christmas fan. Santa in general doesn't really appeal to me, but this Santa feeding the wildlife and he has just the most sweet glowing expression on his face. It just spoke to me when I saw this as a puzzle. I found this puzzle in a puzzle store in the mall in Omaha when I was Christmas shopping one year. And I kind of wanted to buy it, but I was on a budget because I was shopping for Christmas presents, so I didn't get it that year. But I checked on it. I was able to easily find it on Amazon and other online stores. So I said, I'll just get it eventually another time. And then, of course, as Christmas passed, I forgot about the puzzle. And then the next Christmas, I remembered the puzzle and went to the store saw it at the mall in that puzzle store and thought about buying it, but was on a budget for Christmas, was still readily able to find it online. So I figured I'll just buy it elsewhere sometime when I have more room for it in um, my budget and my life. But then Christmas would pass. I forgot about it. On and on, I continued the cycle remembering and looking up this puzzle for about four or five years seriously, until 
one summer, I happen to think about it in July. In July, I'm not on so much of a budget because <laughs> there's no Christmas presents I have to buy in July. So I went on the internet to find the puzzle and it wasn't on Amazon or any of the little shops on the internet anymore. I figured out it had been discontinued. Um, but that puzzle was just sort of this annual thought in my mind <laughs> for so many years that I had to get my hands on it. So I went on eBay and I found the one and only puzzle available anywhere on the internet. So I had this puzzle, a very average quality puzzle that was probably like seven to ten dollars when it was just brand new in this store, you know, mass manufactured. I spent about $45 to have this very average puzzle sent to me from the United Kingdom <laughs> because I thought to buy it way too late. And I put that puzzle together as soon as I got it and I glued it and framed it and now I hang it up at Christmas. Anyway, the point of the story about my Scott Gustafson Woodland Santa puzzle is that I got curious about this piece of artwork. So I Googled it and it turns out there is a hade of this image. Heaven and Earth Designs has a full coverage cross-stitch pattern of Woodland Santa by Scott Gustafson. I myself am not interested in stitching full coverage pieces. That's just not the type of cross-stitch that I'm interested in doing personally. I love watching other floss tubers do full coverage. It's really satisfying to see lots of you guys stitching them. That's incredible, but I know it's not for me personally, but if I were to ever do a Hade, it could very likely be this one <laughs> because this puzzle was just so special to me and it's kind of just a funky story of mine. And Wow, it's a discontinued puzzle and somewhat of an obscure piece of art, but there is a hate of it. I could stitch it. I just thought was it, that was a interesting possibility, and I hope you guys appreciate the story. So anyway, um, maybe if Tim and I continue to do more puzzles here and there, um, that will cut into my stitchy time a bit but I will be sure to show you whatever puzzles we make together if you would be interested in that. Again, let me know in the comments how I should adjust my channel content to your viewing pleasure. <laughs> anyway, that is a second ramble, but it did relate back to cross stitch a little bit. And that is all I have to share with you today. Thank you for listening to all of this and putting up with me in this video. Of course, before I go, I have to share with you the motto of my grandma, who inspired me both in stitching and in life. God loves you and I love you. Happy stitching. Bye-bye. <laughs>